Welcome to part two of topic two on polymer microstructures. In this section we're going to look at polymer melt microstructures and how the polymers are organized within a liquid molten state. Now remember that when we're in the polymer melt, the polymer is at a very high temperature and therefore has a large amount of thermal energy permitting large-scale rotations and translations of the polymer molecules. Well, let's look at rotations a little bit more carefully. So imagine we have this four carbon atom chain. Now it turns out that this chain won't want to occupy a straight coordination. In other words, this orientation where the molecule is down here is not energetically as favorable as having the fourth atom located up here. And the reason for that is because of the presence of the hydrogen atoms repelling each other, but their positive polarities. But it turns so it turns out that at zero degrees for phi, the angle phi, which is shown right here, at zero degrees where you have atom four in this dashed line position, the energy is extremely high. Likewise, at 120 degrees, it's very high. Whoop! Sorry about that. Likewise, at 120 degrees, it's high. But at 180 degrees, the hydrogen atoms are now spread out as much as possible, and we have the lowest energy state possible, shown down here. But there are two, there's one other possibility, or really two other possibilities. At 60 degrees, the, um, the molecules will be in what's called gauche position. So at 180 degrees, they're in the trans position, and at 60 degrees, they'll be in gauche position. They also in gauche position at 300 degrees, which would be in the having this dashed line on the opposite side of the molecule. So gauche is a what we call a metastable condition, where the hydrogen atoms are slightly more spread out, and therefore it's slightly stable, but not not quite as stable as it is at 180 degrees rotation. Well, remember that because the chains are easily able to rotate, they will generally conform to the lowest possible energy state. For five carbon atom chains, there are three to the second rotational isomers, or nine rotational isomers possible when you have five carbon atoms in the chain. And that's because of the possibility for trans and two gauche conditions. For n carbon chains, there are three to the n minus three rotational isomers possible. So for example, if you had polyethylene with a relatively low molecular weight of only 2,800 grams per mole, that's about 200 carbon atoms in a chain. So 3 to the 200 minus 3 power is 9.8 times 10 to the 93rd isomers. In other words, there are almost 10 to the 100th, or 10 to the, about 10 to the 94th, possible rotations, uh, ways that the polymer melt chain can be contorted and twisted. Bottom line is, is that because of these rotations, and these quick rotations in the polymer melt, the polymer chains are going to be very, very twisted up and contorted inside the polymer melt. It turns out that this rotation is very fast. In fact, the polymer bonds are rotating from trans to gauche every 10 to the minus 10 seconds. But the small difference between the trans and the gauche energy states means that trans will be slightly more common. In fact, we can use an Averanius equation to determine the number of gauss rotations. The number of gauss rotations is equal to the number of trans rotations times the exponent of minus the difference in energy, which is about two kilojoules per mole, divided by the gas constant times temperature. What this means is that at low temperatures, trans rotations dominate and the polymers tend to be more linear. And at high temperatures, gauche rotations become more common and you get more contortion in the chain. Now, if chains are highly kinked in a polymer, polymer melt, if we pretend that the polymer is linear, we overestimate the volume occupied by the molecule. And it turns out knowing the volume of the molecule is relatively important to the properties of the molecule, especially in the melt state. So there's an alternative way to measure the polymer dimensions, and that's what's called the end-to-end -end chain length, or r naught. So if we identify the end of one side of the polymer and the other end of the polymer here, the distance between those two ends becomes a dimension that defines the average volume taken up by the polymer. And this is more accurate than assuming that the polymer is a straight chain. We can estimate the dimensions of R0 that R0 average squared equals two times the number of carbon atoms times the bond length squared. And the bond length for a carbon-carbon bond is 0.154 nanometers. 
Another type of uh, dimension we can measure for a coiled polymer chain in the melt state is the radius of gyration, or RG. RG is based on the distribution of polymer mass about the center of gravity of the molecule. And it turns out that it's a ratio of the integral of the radius squared times the mass, di mass distribution as a function of R times dV, or the change in volume, divided by the mass distribution as a function of R times the change in volume. I'm not going to work out these integrals. In fact, I don't remember how to do it myself. But the bottom line is that Rg squared equals 1 6 R naught squared. So if you know R naught, you can convert it to Rg, the radius of gyration. But more importantly, Rg squared is equal to 2 times the, mer the um, weighted average molecular weight of the polymer divided by 3 times its average mer weight times the bond length squared. And in fact, when you look at Rg as a function of molecular mass, Mw, for some simple molecules, you see a linear fit of the data, which is exactly what you'd expect in this equation. You'd have a linear fit with 2 thirds times the mer weight times L squared as the slope of that line. Now entanglement within a polymer is important because it determines the extent to which the polymer will resist flow, and especially in the polymer melt state. If we assume that the polymer resides within a sphere of radius r sub g, the spheres must overlap in order to fit volume computations. In other words, if you computed the volume that a mo polymer molecule rg takes up, and you estimate the number of molecules you have, if they weren't overlapping, the polymer melt would take up more space than it actually does. So therefore, they must overlap and entangle with one another. Entanglements are usually caused by van der Waals forces, but they can also involve physical loops, where one polymer chain loops into another one and physically locks it together. We can actually compute the volume that the the relative volume that a given polymer takes up by taking the end-to-end -end average end length and dividing it by NL squared. So a polystyrene molecule which has large pendant benzene rings takes up a relatively larger volume, 10.8, compared to polyethylene which is a relatively simple molecule which only takes up 6.8 and polycarbonate which only takes up 2.4. Now if I take up a larger volume, I'm going to have less entanglement, so the entanglement density is lower, only 6 compared to what it is for polyethylene and polycarbonate, 61 and 67. And polyethylene terephthalate has the largest entanglement density, meaning that it, its chains will resist flow the most because of the entanglement effect. But keep in mind that the large benzene ring on polystyrene also causes it to resist flow because it's difficult to rotate the bonds with that benzene ring sticking out there.